Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, uh, we will uh, we have seen some dynamic inversion concept last class. We will uh, continue for discussing further on that topic and then try to see some of these uh, difficulties and possible remedies and things like that. But before that we will have a quick review of uh, what we discussed uh, last class and that is how it the topics are organized something like that. We will quickly review uh, some sort of a summary of uh, DI design or dynamic inversion design. We will again list out the, the advantages associated with that and because of these advantages we do not mind for uh, these, these issues and rather hunt out for possible remedies instead of giving up actually. So, that is the that is the way we will uh, discuss in this class. So, a quick review of what we have discussed already uh, last class, this is the summary part of it. So, philosophy of dynamic inversion is, uh, is like this, we carry out uh, some sort of a coordinate transformation such that the nonlinear problem appears to be linear in the transform coordinate. It is not uh, linearization per se, but we just do some sort of a uh, nonlinear function mapping business. So, the, so that uh, in that uh, new coordinates, it will problem appears to be linear. Okay. Then once the problem starts appearing to be linear, then we know linear design, con linear control design techniques. So, we design the control for the linear looking system, again this is not a linear system, but it just appears to be linear that is all actually. So, using that uh, linear looking system, we design a controller using the linear control design techniques and once you are done in that coordinate frame, we want to see what is the controller in the original system. So, we do some sort of a inverse transformation actually. So, obviously, this design philosophy holds good if and only if uh, the inverse transformation is possible actually okay, and there is, there is a unique inverse transformation that is also an issue basically. Anyway. So, anyway, so this, uh, uh, so intuitively what, what is going on here is the control design is carried out by enforcing some sort of a stable linear error dynamics in the transform coordinate frame, that is the, that is the bottom line actually. Now, uh, uh, how do we do the mathematics part of it, something like that we discussed last class. In general, the nonlinear systems can be described uh, system state equations like this, x dot is f of x u, y is h of x where x u and y can be of different dimensions actually, x is state, uh, u is control and y is uh, the performance output actually, which, uh, which also is a nonlinear function of states. And the goal objective, uh, we want to assure that uh, this performance output so should, uh, should track some result output that is uh, y should go to y star as t goes to infinity actually. So, and the assumption here is y star is, uh, is a smooth vector actually. That means y is continuous and y dot is also continuous at least. And then uh, special class, uh, I mean uh, this this itself is a little con, I mean kind of complicated system dynamics and all that. So we don't, uh, I mean it's possible to deal with, and then people have concentrated a lot of attention for uh, for designing controllers for this class of generic nonlinear systems. But in this this particular lecture, we'll confine ourselves to a class of problems uh, where we. I mean we take this control affine systems where control variable appears to be linear and in addition to that uh, p is equal to m that means the uh, u I mean the dimension of u and y are same. That means in input output sense uh, the system is a square system basically and this g y of x which we will define in the next slide it, uh, is, uh, is non singular for all time because we need a matrix inversion for this matrix. G and g y are different of course, I mean they are related but they are different. So, what is gy? We will see that in the next slide anyway. So, this is our objective, y should go to y star, a tracking objective and we concentrate ourselves to control a fine square and for which gy of x is non-singular for all time. So, how do you do that? So, for assuring that we will first do uh, what we did is we derived this y dot and uh, because y is h of x, so y dot is del x by del x into x dot and x dot is that. So, we substituted that and then defined what is f y and g y. So, f y is del h by del x into f and g y is del h by del x into z. So, that is g y actually. 
and del h by del x is defined uh, in this matrix actually. Okay, so that is the Jacobian matrix sort of thing. So this matrix z y of x needs to be non-singular basically. We will see that in the next slide why it needs to be like that. So we our objective is that y should go to y star. So we define an error vector which is y minus y star and then make sure that e goes to 0 asymptotically. And how do you do that? We do that by selecting some sort of a fixed gain k with a positive definite matrix such that this error dynamics is enforced. And we know that once this error dynamics is enforced, the solution is uh, like this e equal to exponential minus k t into e 0. And because k is a positive definite matrix by selection, it needs to go to 0 actually. Okay, so, s t goes to infinity. Uh, remember that uh, this first of all this t goes to infinity is, uh, is mathematical notion and uh, for practical problems this t goes I mean this infinity and all that is largely dictated by the settling time that we select actually. Okay. So, if the settling time is small that means uh, the tracking happens in small time and things like that. And also second point is this uh, positive definite gain matrix. Uh, need not be constant in some applications you can have limited gain scheduling as well that is that is also an option provided we really need that most of the time it so happens that we may not need that actually. Okay. Then uh, okay, this is what the objective was so what do we do to enforce this error dynamics we substitute this e equal to y minus y star so e dot is y dot minus y star dot e y minus y star so enforce this error dynamics. And then y dot is something that we derived here. If, okay, so y dot we substitute, and then uh, try to solve for a controller u. So that's how you get a control thing. Control, I mean, so it's a nonlinear function for control. Okay, that's what we obtain with a fixed gain k. Okay, so this control, uh, this controller is, uh, I mean, this formula what you see here so is uh, once you, you start using this, is, uh, this essentially satisfies this equation, hence this equation, and hence that one. That means this uh, this uh, e dot plus k e is continuously enforced actually. Okay. So that is how this uh, uh, this uh, control design works. We discussed many details on that uh, last class actually. And usually the, the way to select this gain matrix for the first order dynamics is is like this. Okay, okay, you select k equal to diagonal one by tau. Because if is k is a diagonal matrix, then eigenvalues are diagonal elements, and then they are certainly positive for positive tau and then it needs to be positive definite actually. Alright, so this is uh, the how do you design that. Now the question, question here is uh, do we always enforce this first order error dynamics? Uh, certainly not. So this is dictated by what is called relative degree and the relative degree is defined as the number of times the output needs to be differentiated so that the control variable appears explicitly. That means each of the output vectors, I mean each of the component of the output, output vector you can keep on uh, taking derivatives and in each of the component of output vector will uh, at some point of uh, I mean derivative and uh, I mean this control variable start appearing and that becomes a relative degree for that particular component of the error vector, I mean this uh, output vector and that is called a relative degree and the total relative degree is just addition of those uh, individual relative degrees by the way. So, what you are assuming here is each of the component of, the, of this E satisfy the same order okay. if it happens then you can uh, vectorially represent this equation that way. So, instead of first order error dynamics you can you can uh, uh, try to I mean enforce the second order error dynamics in, instead where KV is uh, can be selected that way and K k p can be selected that way. So, that each of the individual component wise it becomes a standard second order aerodynamics in the form of e double dot plus uh, 2 zeta omega n and the e dot plus omega n square e equal 0. That is a very standard uh, aerodynamics or uh, linear system that for which you know the solution behavior and things like that. So, obviously, this k p and k v uh, can, can be selected this way diagonal uh, I mean diagonal matrix manner. And this zeta and omega n can always be selected from performance specifications like again like settling time percentage over suit like that for each individual error channel actually. Now we also discussed when the dynamic inversion does not work, when does it fail. Okay. So, the, for understanding that we also discussed that this uh, the fundamental principle of dynamic inversion is to differentiate y repeatedly until u appears in a single input single output sense and then uh, design u to cancel the nonlinearity, all that we do and then uh, simultaneously it, uh, it enforces some sort of uh, stable or uh, aerodynamics actually. So, is it always possible to design you this way? The answer turns out to be not necessarily true and it is possible I mean only if the relative degree is well defined actually and uh, to understand what is well defined 
uh, we need to see this what is undefined relative degree and the, this definition turns out to be like this. It may so happen that upon successive differentiation of y, u does appear, u appears. However, the coefficient of u may vanish at x, whereas it arbitrarily close to x0, okay, is, it does not vanish. It only vanishes at a selected point x0, but very close to x0, it does not vanish actually. So, how do I mean just to understand this, so as a small example, this x1 dot x2 dot is uh, something like this, okay, this uh, if you if you take it that way then uh, y let us say assume that x 1 square then y dot is like this y double dot is like that. So, so, what happens here is if you can rearrange this term and it turns out that f y is like this and g y is like that. So, as x 1 is 0 then g y of uh, x turns out to be 0. So, the entire x 1 0 line the entire x 2 x is g y turn x is actually 0, but the moment you go a little bit away from that 2 x 1 is non 0 actually. Okay. That means, uh, at x 1 equal to 0, the relative degree is not defined obviously. Okay. So, what do you, how do you circumvent this problem? Probably you can go back and think, okay, let me select a different y, y equal x y x 1 square is not good. So, let me select x 1, then what happens is, uh, if you do the double derivatives and all that, uh, the coefficient of e is 1, which is non 0 throughout actually, mm -hmm. globally. So, if you select y equal x 1 for the same problem, the relative degree is well defined but if you select x 1 square it is uh, not defined actually. Okay. So, this is how the you can think that okay, the relative degree is defined well defined then you can talk about uh, doing dynamic inversion. If there is a problem for that then I may not be able to do that actually. So, the advantage is uh, what we this summarized last class it uh, turns out to be a very simple design because there is no need of uh, tedious gain scheduling in general. Uh, sometimes uh, you may need for very challenging practical applications you may need uh, a small amount of scheduling. Uh, for example, in missile guidance uh, some people sometimes people do limited scheduling with, based on uh, some sort of maneuverability actually, maneuver capability. If they calculate how much you can maneuver at any point of time and make, a, make the gain as a function of that. But it is very, I mean uh, only when it is absolutely necessary, otherwise it turns out that uh, Again, scheduling is not required actually. Okay. So, it is also sometimes called as a universal gain scheduling design because just by, just by selecting one gain, you are taking care of the entire domain of operation actually. It is easy for online implementation because it is a closed form solution after all. There is no iterative solutions involved here, you just uh, keep, keep on evaluating a formula once you know the information about the state. Then always this there is asymptotic or other exponential stability is guaranteed for the error dynamics. As far as output tracking error is concerned, that has to go to 0, I mean rather uh, asymptotic or exponential way and instead it, it uh, that is true globally also because what you are doing here is uh, linear system error dynamics and the, that is nothing to do with local stability. Okay. So, so, global exponential stability for error dynamics is uh, guaranteed as far as output tracking is concerned, subjected to obviously control availability. If your control is saturated, that formula is no more valid anyway. And we also discussed last class that there is uh, no problem if the parameters are updated. That means, uh, if your design changes or goes through modifications and uh, some, some values of the parameters are changed, if you have opted for a purely linear design followed by the standard classical gain scheduling, then you have to go back and uh, start from the beginning because your potentially your AB matrices all over are changed actually. Okay. But here it does not happen that way, you, uh, you all that you have is a formula and that formula needs to be evaluated with respect to the new set of parameters basically. So, you may still need to tune your gains a little bit here and there, but uh, normally this does not require too much of exercise. So, that uh, scalability of design or uh, that what you call rapid prototyping and things like that, it is very easy actually. That means, uh, once you are very comfortable with this kind of design, then you can uh, go from, I mean you can very quickly synthesize your controller for the entire system, for the entire flight envelope actually. Okay, so, these are the uh, big advantages of the dynamic inversion design and hence we uh, do not mind looking at the possible issues and trying to hunt out for remedies actually. Okay, so, when the, those are the things that we will discuss next in this class. This up to now is all summary of what we discussed uh, last class in detail. So, issues and remedies in DI design. Okay, so, let us talk about that. This to summarize, there are potentially there we can think about uh, four or five issues, and then uh, first issue that comes to mind is does the inverse exist for all time? Okay. 
we always said, I mean if you go back to this uh, final uh, formula, there is a matrix inversion and even if the matrix can uh, make matrix may exist, the inversion may not exist actually. And what you are demanding here is that this matrix remains non-singular for all time because x is a time varying function, I mean x, x uh, varies with time. So, g y a of x is a time varying matrix actually. So, will it remains non-singular for all time that is the first issue. Okay. Now, what if the problem is non-square? So, we have conveniently assumed before that p equal to m that means number of outputs are equal to number of inputs that is why g y of x turns out to be a square matrix. If it does not become square you cannot even talk about inverse actually. So, what you do in the in those situations actually. Then there are two big issues in DI design in general even if these two are taken care uh, the third issue is what about this internal dynamics. That means, uh, what you have done is uh, making sure that y goes to y star in other words uh, y minus y star error that goes to 0 that is all right actually. But also remember that uh, dimension of y is much lesser than dimension of x normally. So, we have uh, make I mean uh, in this design make sure that everything remains uh, very good in the output space that means, uh, the in the subspace of uh, the in the problem basically. So, what about uh, those uh, n minus p dimensions actually. Okay. So, the, the dynamics of the system do exist in those directions I mean those dimensions as well. So, what about, what about that dynamics that is something called internal dynamics because that is uh, not coming into picture of uh, this y dot ex expression the output dynamics actually. We will see that that is internal dynamics and the another big issue it turns out that uh, it is uh, I mean the, any design that you propose any control design should have some good amount of robustness with respect to modeling errors because no modeling can be very perfect. We all know that uh, there will be modeling inaccuracies and things like that and uh, it unfortunately it turns out that uh, this particular design is sensitive to modeling inaccuracies. Okay. That means, uh, if, if you have parameter inaccuracies or if you have some, some terms that you missed out in the model and the things like that, then it is typically not uh, very robust actually. So, these are the reasons why I mean this particularly this is probably the most important reason why for many years this design was not very popular actually. Okay. But people did not know how to handle this anyway. All right, so, we will see these issues one by one and try to see some, some sort of remedies and all that philosophically. Okay. Some, some things we will tell precisely, some things we will leave it to further discussions in, uh, in subsequent classes actually. Okay. First thing is does the inverse exist for all time as we discussed or not necessarily. So, this g y of x inverse that you have uh, taken care uh, I mean that you have used uh, need not admit uh, uh, an inverse for all time. Okay. Now, there are two issues. So, one thing is it, uh, it may not admit uh, I mean it can become singular for a longer time okay, or it can singular for, for a smaller time intermittent times actually. Okay. So, if it happens to be for a longer time then probably there is something wrong in the formulation itself we need to go back and see whether that is uh, what you have actually formulated is right or wrong actually. And most likely it will turn out that the entire formulation somehow it is wrong. So, we need to do something else for that. For example, if the controllability is not there uh, in the plant then uh, it will turn out it will pop up that uh, these kind of issues uh, will be quite large actually. If in, in other words, if your controller is less less effective for the output uh, objective, whatever objective is there, then it may not it may it may struggle to do that, and hence it will not be able to do that actually that way. Okay, so I mean, uh, for example, if you want to roll an aircraft, you know, by limited coupling, you can also use rudder to roll the aircraft, but uh, primary control surfaces are ailerons actually. So for for some reason, if ailerons are not uh, functioning properly, they are stuck or something. Only for a very small amount of manipulation you can do using rudder actually. Okay. Otherwise, if you really want to roll it very large quantity and all, rudder will go to saturation and then it will this matrix inversion will go non single I mean this matrix will go singular and things like that. So, that is a that is a fundamental problem there. Now, what if uh, if that uh, matrix inversion happens to be I mean singular for small intervals of time. And for that the, the engineering uh, solution uh, tells that okay, we, we do not have to update your controller unless otherwise this condition holds good actually. Okay. That means, uh, I take the determinant of the matrix g y of x, I keep on taking at every point of time, take an absolute value of that and if it is beyond certain bound, I know for sure that the matrix is non-singular okay. and uh, then only I will update the control otherwise I will not. 
So, obviously, when I am not updating the control, I am just holding my previous control or something, it may lead to performance degradation locally. So, you will not be able to track your uh, commanded variable and things like that, but that will happen only locally. Okay. And then uh, uh, after you are out of that, that means uh, after you are out of the singularity domain, then again this will uh, this condition will hold good and hence you can still be able to update your controller actually. So, what uh, my recommendation is like uh, whether it happens or not, uh, keep it as an integral part of your programming actually, like whenever you want to implement a controller, just before updating the controller have this check actually, okay. only when this uh, check is uh, passed through then only you uh, update your control otherwise hold the previous control. Okay. The, uh, I mean that will be true after your first uh, time step, but first time step usually if the first time step itself there is a singularity then you have to really go back and think, think something else actually. Okay, so, option is always there to reformulate the problem that means uh, if I have uh, m too much or m too sharp a maneuver or something like that I can lead to a lesser I mean kind of not so highly demanding maneuver that means I can do a nice turning instead of a sharp turning sort of thing. These are like reformulating the problem actually okay. or uh, I mean I can even think of some sort of adding some control surface in addition to what I have I mean that is a design change fundamentally and things like that. Okay. So, that these are like uh, uh, subjected to problems, subjected to uh, capability of the vehicle and uh, capability of the system like that actually. Okay. But apart from this, uh, this engineering fixes and, and uh, philosophical issues and things like that, there are also some advanced techniques uh, um, to address this issue partly it does, uh, in the control design process itself. Okay. That means, uh, we do not, we are not going to talk uh, too much on that in this class, but uh, there are, uh, there are uh, uh, techniques available which will prevent this from happening. So, here we are just assuming, okay, we are just putting some sort of a condition and then hoping for the best. But these techniques what you are talking here will try, will purposefully try to avoid this uh, being I mean this singularity issue coming into your system actually. So, they will keep on monitoring some sort of a determinant rate and things like that philosophically and then they will try to modify and telling that okay, if you are approaching determinant approaches to 0 then probably that is not the right way to go right direction to go basically. So, the I mean the, but more on that probably you can pick up some, some literature or something and see, try to see that actually. But fundamentally if there is no controllability in the plant locally, you cannot do anything actually. Okay, so, so that is an issue that uh, you should be aware of actually. Anyway, so coming back, uh, my suggestion is invariably have this, uh, this check in your uh, implementation of the dynamic inversion controller before updating your control actually. Alright, next issue, what if the output dynamics is non-square, that means uh, dimension of y is not equal to dimension of p, in that sense g y of x is, is non-square actually. Okay. So, obviously, we cannot talk about inversion of that matrix. Now, there are two cases may, may happen, that means first case is m is less than p, and the second case is m is greater than p. So, m is less than p means number of controllers are less than number of objectives. Okay, number of independent controllers are less than number of independent objectives here actually. So, in that situation there is a, there is a great theorem which tells us that perfect tracking is not possible in general. Okay. That means, only for limited objectives that means, uh, like regulator design and things like that you can do some sort of a manipulation of the variable you select uh, x 2 instead of x 1. So, that it, uh, you can attain your objective and things like that. One example we saw that in the last class also that we how do you handle this uh, for a second order system and all that actually. But in general for arbitrary signal tracking the theorem tells that it is not possible actually. You cannot demand an arbitrary signal and then tell me to track it unless and otherwise I have at least the same number of independent controllers as the number of objectives that you want me to track actually. Okay, so, that is a I mean that is the theorem that we will uh, will accept it without proof actually. But anyway, so the case 2 is uh, rather interesting which tells you what if the reverse case. Okay. So, I buy that because I have not given you enough uh, capability here when m is less than p, but suppose I give you more capability m is greater than p, then what? Okay. So, obviously, the large more control capability than the demand actually. So, the certainly I mean uh, I mean intuition tells us that it is possible the tracking objective has to be met actually. 
But in addition to meeting the tracking objective, we can always put additional objectives because we have larger number of controllers, we have more number of controllers anyway. Okay. So, uh, we can put additional objectives uh, can be demanded in the in the design uh, in general actually. So, in one such approach is what we call as optimal dynamic conversion. There, there are various ways of interpreting this problem obviously and I will take you through one development that uh, we in our lab have, have been using that we propose this and then trying to use it actually. Anyway, so this is uh, this is something like uh, m is uh, greater than p. So, what we let us let us go back to this uh, this entire design process and try to see where we are uh, invoking this issue actually. So, if you go back and see this math, this is where we started with uh, that we have to enforce this e dot plus k equal to 0 and carry out the algebra. So, we can we substituted e equal to y minus y star e dot is y dot minus y star dot y dot is like that we have derived it before and then we will tell okay, this from here to here we cannot do that because this uh, I mean here to here is okay, but the, the step that we discussed uh, last time that we cannot solve a control directly taking g y of x in inverse, where g y is no more a square matrix actually. Okay. But I can always interpret this equation as a constraint equation. So, I have to find a solution in such a way that this, this equation is satisfied actually for whatever reason. So, this equation I will rewrite it that way. Okay, and I will define this a and b for notational simplicity. Okay, so, that this is this is a time varying matrix a, this is a time varying vector v. So, the equation turns out to be something like a u equal to b, a times u equal to b. Just to remember that a and b are no more constant matrices and vectors, they are time varying matrices and vectors actually. But this equation is still valid actually, okay, just that from this equation we will not be able to solve for u directly. Okay, but this equation itself is valid, so I will interpret this as a constraint equation. So, if the if I somehow find a control solution satisfying this constraint equation, that means this equation is again satisfied, this equation is still valid and I will have the uh, tracking objective met anyway. Now, how do, how do I find some sort of a solution for this you? Remember, this is under constraint problem, because number of controllers are larger than number of outputs, that means uh, number of free variables that you are talking is larger than number of constraints actually. Okay, so, this is under constraint problem. So, let me put additional objective for which I will take okay, I will let me if, if something is given to me or some problem demands that I will do something justifiable, something meaningful then I will put that also as a tracking objective, but without that knowledge I will uh, always I can always formulate some sort of a control minimizing problem actually. I will uh, try to get a control solution for which this out this performance index needs to be minimized at all time this is a quadratic performance index. So, I will try to minimize this control effort okay, subject to this uh, this constraint equation that I am talking actually. So, this constraint equation guarantees uh, tracking and this objective what I have been talking about this guarantees minimum control effort uh, for that tracking basically. Okay. So, now we can see that this uh, for any point of time uh, this is a standard uh, kind of quadratic performance index with the linear uh, constraint equation and hence it is uh, very uh, rather standard to solve it using static optimization ideas and all that actually. So, we will interpret okay, this is my cost function to minimize this is a constant equation. So, that augmented performance index turns out to be j plus lambda transpose a u minus b and then I have to satisfy both the equations together uh, del j bar by del e equal to 0 and del j bar by del lambda also equal to 0 and lambda is the lambda dimension of lambda is same as dimension of uh, y obviously, because it is coming from this constant equation actually. Okay. All right. So, how do you do that? Suppose del j bar by del j bar by del u let us say you do then this the first term you get r u, the second term you get a transpose lambda. So, r u plus a transpose lambda needs to be 0 and the second one if you do this turns out to be a u minus b equal to 0 that means a u equal to b which is nothing but the constant equation again. So, these are all given here. So, first r u plus a transpose lambda 0, a u minus b equal to 0. So, these two equation needs to be solved together. So, let me solve for u from here. So, u is nothing but minus uh, r inverse a transpose lambda and then if I substitute that u here back actually what I am getting here is a times that is nothing but b, a times u whatever u I have is equal to b. So, let me solve for lambda from here and lambda solution turns out to be like that. And once I get a lambda solution, I will put it back here in the control solution. So, my control turns out to be r inverse a transpose this entire matrix inverse times b. And this is possible because uh, why is it possible? Because at the if you if you see this, 
this a lambda equal to b and things like that. This particular matrix a times r inverse times a transpose is certainly I mean certainly a some sort of a square matrix and more than that uh, because r is uh, supposed to be positive definite here okay. uh, that is the requirement for uh, some sort of a convex uh, cross function and all that. What you are telling here r needs to be positive definite and again by a uh, standard mantra sort of thing is we just take r is a diagonal matrix to begin with actually. Okay, so, that means uh, uh, I mean this particular R being a positive definite matrix, R inverse is also positive definite matrix and uh, because of that A times R inverse A transpose is guaranteed to be positive semi definite matrix. It is going to be square, it is going to be symmetric, it is also going to be positive semi definite. So, that is how we I will be able to talk about an inverse. All that I am assuming here is uh, there is no this positive semi definite means there is a chance of getting singular again also. Basically. So, that one what I am assuming here is this particular matrix is non singular here by assumption, but this is a square matrix certainly and that is how I have avoided this issue of taking inverse of a non square matrix actually that is the philosophy. So, anyway so coming back uh, this this constant equation satisfy I mean guarantees error uh, dynamics I mean the error uh, of tracking goes to 0 and then this uh, objective function that I am selecting also guarantees that I, I have a control minimizing solution for that. And the way I select for R uh, that uh, that means let us say R I select R 1, R 2, R 3 as diagonal elements and all that. Selection of this R 1, uh, R 2 and all that will also give me some sort of a uh, allocation technique basically, control allocation technique. That means if I select R 1 higher than the rest of the things, then this design will assure that U 1 magnitude turns out to be lesser than rest of the things basically. So, that way I will be able to tune my control components using as a proper selection of R actually. Alright, so, this is what you call as opti optimal dynamic inversion because there is some sort of a optimal control allocation actually okay, that is the reason for that. And some useful features of ODI optimal dynamic inversion is uh, as I told you already the, enfor the enforced error dynamics is satisfied exactly. So, asymptotic tracking behavior is not compromised. ODI also gives a platform for op optimal control allocation as I also told you now. So, it this this can be done both time wise as well as location wise or uh, component wise actually because uh, this R matrix what you are selecting here need not be uh, kind of constant matrix it can also be function of time. So, uh, as time goes you can I can enlarge one component and sink one component and things like that initially you may want to use some some particular component larger later you do not want to use it larger and things like all that thing can be incorporated by making r as a function of time also as a function of components of the I mean various components actually like r 1, r 2, r 3 stands uh, essentially stands for u 1, u 2, u 3 I mean the magnitude of that provided r is a diagonal matrix. Now, an interesting observation turns out that what if I select uh, r as identity matrix. Now, if you go back and um, see this expression and r is identity means r inverse is also identity that means I land, I land up with something like A transpose A transpose inverse times B. So, this A transpose A transpose inverse is nothing but pseudo inverse actually ok. So, if I take pseudo inverse B, so without uh, under, I mean without all this uh, I mean algebra and all I just land up here this is a non square matrix. So, I just uh, talk about pseudo inverse. And that is also an optimal solution in this in the, in the sense that R becomes identity that means uh, equal distribution of uh, control effort in all channel actually. So, without understanding all the details if somebody takes a pseudo inverse for that it is also ok because what it takes talks about is uh, some sort of a right pseudo inverse and things like that and that is good because uh, this is a under constrained equation. If it happens to be over constrained equation pseudo inverse solution is never good actually we have discussed that in matrix theory also. With you. So, those of you forgot that you can uh, go back to the matrix theory lecture and then try to recapitulate some of that. Anyway, so this is what we are talking uh, that is just a, as a special case r equal to i then you can uh, land up with uh, a graceful degradation to pseudo inverse constant design. But otherwise uh, we retain more generality here because you can uh, the, the fact is we can uh, it gives us a platform for optimal control allocation both time wise as well as location wise or component wise basically. So, that is that is the beauty of this uh, ODI basically. And also the as a just a comment sort of thing this ODI idea can be extended to distributed parameter system control because that that is where you have this infinite modes and things like that comes. So, invariably you will end up with under constraint problems and all that actually. 
we will not talk too much on that, but uh, so those of you want to st study more, these are the references from our research output. output. And first one is uh, it uh, talks about some sort of a biomedical problem and all, but there is a generic section on this paper which uh, talks about uh, this theory as a, as a generic framework actually. Okay. And then this second one is, uh, is, a, is you can think of as a some sort of an extension to distributed parameter systems. Okay. How do you use this ODI concept for that actually? Okay. So, let us move on to the next topic, the next big topic. The question here is, is the internal dynamics always stable? Okay, that is a major issue. So, these last two issues were the primary really big issues that we did, uh, that was uh, like uh, why this DI design was not very popular for a long time. Okay. All right. So, the, the is the internal dynamics always stable? Answer turns out to be not necessarily so again. Okay. And obviously, if the controls are, I mean, the, if, the, if the internal dynamics is non-stable, I am unstable, then obviously it is uh, somewhat like, uh, I mean, operation success, what, what patient died sort of thing. I mean, that means uh, the control solution is meaningless because the uh, internal dynamics, the dynamics in the rest of the space is going unstable. Okay, that means uh, your system uh, as a whole can can behave very badly actually. Your output tracking may happen, but your system may even burn out, even crash, and things like that. For example, if you talk about let us say turning, I mean turning an aircraft maneuvering and things like the lateral dynamics and if uh, lateral dynamics you simply turn a circle sort of thing okay? and while talk, taking a circular turn your, uh, your uh, longitudinal dynamics becomes unstable that means height can be negative that means your uh, I mean height can go unstable it can come the entire aircraft can, can cross actually. So, as far as lateral dynamics is concerned, I mean that uh, you can, I mean if you project the trajectory probably it will be still be a circle, but if you pro project the uh, I mean trajectory from top actually it will still be a circle, but uh, the aircraft will essentially going some sort of helical path okay, because and then altitude is dropping, dropping and finally it is crossing actually. Okay. So, uh, no point in having such sort of uh, design where you can only concentrate about output actually. So, invariably what it turns out that the moment you talk about dynamic inversion design, I mean all that you are discussing here is input output linearization by the way and uh, there is another parallel concept called input to state linearization which are not discussing here at all actually. Okay. So, for that design the internal dynamics is not an issue, but the input output uh, version is very practical that is what lot of people use in variety of applications and that is where internal dynamics needs to be explicitly addressed. That means, uh, any design that you any design that you propose based on dynamic inversion, you should take extreme care and to explicitly demonstrate that internal dynamics remain stable. It, it, it should never be an assumption actually. Okay. So, coming back the control solution is meaningless unless this issue is addressed explicitly. Okay. So, there are some standard results. First, first result tells us that if the relative degree that means, the total relative degree that is what I am talking. If the total relative degree of the problem is equal to the number of states, then the internal dynamics is stable. And again, the what is total relative degree? Like uh, relative degrees of each of the components of the output vector. You just add them up actually. Okay. If that uh, total relative degree turns out to be equal to number of states, that means uh, there is no internal dynamics actually. Every every dynamics, every space, I mean dynamics in every uh, kind of dimension is visible in the design. So, the internal dynamics is uh, not there or in other words internal dynamics is always stable actually. Okay, everything goes to the output vector actually. All right. Now, the, uh, the why it happens by the way because if I enforce a stable second order dynamics then not only may uh, let us say like E double dot plus something like K 1 times E dot plus uh, I mean if I write it somewhere like uh, let us say if I assume this E double dot plus 2 zeta omega and E dot and things like that 2 zeta omega n e dot plus omega n square e equal to 0, then this design not only enforces that e goes to 0, it also enforces that e dot goes to 0, Two, together it happens actually. So, the moment I take a second order aerodynamics, I am, I am I have taken care of two dimensions actually and similarly, if I take care of uh, those many dimensions, then I am done actually that way. If the total number, total relative degree turns out to be equal to the number of states, then I have taken care of the stability of all the dimensions actually. Now, but that is a very uh, lucky sort of situation that means many times it, it, it will not happen that way. Okay. So, extreme rare cases only you will end up with those situations where you have uh, enough controllability for uh, for example actually. Okay. So, for, for example, if you talk about only 
let us say attitude stability of a satellite uh, with 3 axis control, independent control. Then for each of the axis you can think of it as some sort of a double integrator and then um, theta and omega in each of the axis will go to 0 means some stable values actually. But that is a very rare situation that uh, the, every problem will not admit that kind of solution actually. So, what next? The next is uh, there is something called zero dynamics and the theorem tells that asymptotic stability of zero dynamics is sufficient for local input to state stability of internal dynamics. I mean these are uh, concept, I mean more details if somebody wants they can always see Slotin and Lee book, they are, there is a nice chapter for this uh, these discussions and all that actually. But anyway, for, uh, zero dynamics means uh, like uh, what you define as zero dynamics is something like that you purposefully take that y star that we discussed as 0, 0 for all time actually. So, irrespective of whatever command that you are giving, you formulate a parallel artificial problem for which y star is 0, y star dot double dot all that are 0 actually and then redesign your control. Okay. So, with respect to that control because what is that? I mean that has become completely independent of the output command that you want to track. So, and hence that becomes some sort of a intrinsic property of a system actually. Okay, so, that way it is uh, that is what we want to call that a zero dynamics okay. and if the zero dynamics happens to be stable okay, because remember after the tracking variable goes to 0 and things like that, the track the, the I mean the what you are assuming is, is that zero command has already been tracked actually. So, whatever is left out is nothing but uh, what is called a zero dynamics actually. The difference between zero dynamics and internal dynamics is uh, for internal dynamics you are actually giving the desired command for zero dynamics you are artificially giving a zero command okay, and hence it becomes some sort of a homogeneous system actually. Okay. So, the zero dynamics remains uh, if the, the, the theorem tells us that the, if the zero dynamics is stable okay, that means asymptotically stable and things like that which can be kind of assured using Lyapunov theory because it is some sort of a homogeneous system dynamics. And uh, this Lyapunov theory and all we are going to discuss uh, next class actually, next class on worst, uh, then we will see that actually what are the implications. But anyway, if the zero dynamics happens to be asymptotically stable, then it is sufficient for uh, to, to tell that the, uh, in, uh, the internal dynamics uh, is, uh, is stable in the input to state sense. That means, uh, internal dynamics is guaranteed to be stable actually. Okay. So, all right. So, that is uh, what it is, but if that is all sometimes also it is difficult for complicated problem because you will end up with some sort of a complicated zero dynamics. How do you show that? And one thing to show that is uh, okay, the zero dynamics can be linearized about uh, whatever you are at uh, the nominal trajectory and keep on showing that the linearized zero dynamics will remain stable and then you invoke this uh, this uh, what that indirect early up no theorem which tells okay, if, uh, if the linear system around some point is stable then uh, non-linear system is also stable locally, I mean that 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 is the way to do that. Otherwise directly you can invoke this Lyapunov direct theorem then that is the best. But even if you do not again I mean if you may not be able to do all that then uh, in other words if the analytical justification is not possible okay, then extensive simulation studies must be carried out actually. Okay. So, at least from the simulation studies you have to show I mean that is the Monte Carlo simulation and things like that that even if uh, I take uh, I mean the various uh, signals to track and things like that then uh, internal dynamics still remains stable actually. Okay, so this zero dynamics concepts also gives us this uh, this idea of what is called minimum phase systems, and that by definition, this minimum phase systems uh, are nonlinear systems for which the zero dynamics is stable. Okay, so if the zero dynamics is stable, that means the internal dynamics will, stable, will be stable, and hence there is no problem actually. And this minimum phase, the non-minimum phase, and things like that that we study uh, in uh, classical. Uh, systems that means the right hand side um, zeros and things like that that those of you know and uh, we have also discussed some of that in the very beginning classes actually. So, if the right, there is a right hand side zero sort of thing it excites some sort of a non minimum phase behavior and things like that actually those concepts are related to that also. Okay. That means what happens there is in the, the right hand side uh, whatever zeros becomes right hand side pole for the internal dynamics actually. Okay. That is where the connectivity comes and all that. All that. So, this, this, this definition what you see here is not very different from what you have already known actually that way. So, if the system is uh, for, so there is a system for which the zero dynamics is unstable that means that is not a very good candidate for dynamic inversion actually. 
Okay, so there are remedies to do that actually. So is there a procedure for tracking control? I mean, the, the next question is obviously: Is there a procedure for tracking control design for non-minimum phase systems? That means for which the zero dynamics is not really good. An answer turns out to be fortunately yes. Yeah, we can do that actually. And this is something called output redefinition technique. Okay, and this technique is available for which the internal dynamics is first made locally stable before achieving the tracking objective. So, first you make sure that the internal dynamics remain stable okay. and then on that system you try to design some sort of a tracking controller actually. Okay. So, your control objective will be split into two, I mean two sort of roles actually okay. and some time back we discussed that also like uh, while I mean while de developing aircraft you can make sure that uh, it behaves like another aircraft and then design a controller for that aircraft I mean that kind of idea basically you know, philosophically. So, first you make sure that your uh, the controller will first make sure that the uh, internal dynamics is locally stable and then try to attain the tracking objective. Okay. And in that uh, attempt you may not be able to do a perfect job also by the way, but approximate job which is very close to what you want is also all right actually. <laughs> all right and uh, that is what uh, more on that you can study on those these two papers. This is the second one is probably the uh, kind of uh, the seminal paper which uh, was first proposed all that and this is probably a little bit math oriented and uh, good for academicians and further research things like that. But uh, for engineering things and understanding this technique and all I will probably re suggest the first one actually. Okay. Anyway, so what is philosophically? Let us try to understand this uh, little bit at least uh, uh, and then before um, stopping this uh, discussion. So, the key idea for this output redefinition technique is uh, do not aim for perfect tracking, but uh, approximate tracking is ok. okay that means, uh, but approximate should be very close to what you really want, I mean that is in that sense actually. And uh, so, so, what is the idea there? The, let the original output be some y equal h of x, which has an unstable zero dynamics. So, what do you do then? We define y1, which is h1 of x, such that the risk, uh, the, the resulting zero dynamics for y1 tracking is stable. We do not want, we do not aim for y tracking, we, want, we aim for y1 tracking instead. And uh, what you do is after this objective is met, we go back and see that uh, the design I mean design the controller such that y 1 goes to y d of t or y star of t exactly. Then this implies good tracking of the original output provided certain conditions are met actually. Okay. So, what is the what is going on here is something like this. We make sure that y 1 tracking is achieved then go back and analyze how much error will make with respect to y actually instead that particular design what you are proposing for y 1 tracking is it really good or bad for y tracking I mean that that is the way. And it turns out if the y1 is selected properly in a judicious manner, then y and y1 may not be too bad actually, this approach may not be too bad. How do you do that? Let us see a small example. The example is again I have taken from slot and Lee book, applied nonlinear control, slot and Lee. Anyway, let us talk about some sort of a, a linear single input, single output system for which you can represent it using transfer functions actually. So, if you y and u are related by this transfer function, then obviously there is a right hand side 0 here s equal to b for which and the clearly there is a problem of internal dynamics, zero dynamics is unstable obviously. Okay. So, the system has a right side right hand side uh, plane 0 at s equal to b and then the to avoid that what we will do is we will simply take out this and formulate a y 1. Okay. Remember b 0 does not contain a right hand side 0 actually that is our assumption. Okay. So, we define an y 1 and make sure that y 1 tracks our objective everything is met actually. Now, what if uh, we will analyze what happens to y basically that is the objective. So, y 1 has gone to y d already, y d turns out desired actually, this is the y d and y star are same. So, y 1 has gone to y d and uh, so what you do uh, and then what we do is we analyze uh, the case when y 1 is equal to y d y 1 has gone to y d that is the that is the uh, assumption actually. Now, what is y? y and y 1 are defined like that. So, obviously, y and y 1 are related like that right y, y 1 is defined like this. So, y is defined like that. So, y y is this times whatever this times y 1. Okay. So, that is what you are written here y is nothing but that uh, 1 minus s by v times y 1. So, obviously, this y 1 has gone to y d already. So, instead of y 1 I can substitute y d. 
and then error error is defined that way. So, right. So that means uh, this uh, I can define this. Uh, see this uh, derivatives and all. If you see that actually, okay. Right. This is uh, see. Remember this one is y d minus y d dot by v. This this is this expression. If you expand it, nothing but y d minus y d dot by v is multiplied by s is nothing but time derivative actually. So, y d minus y d dot by v minus y d that means you will end up with this this expression actually. Okay. So, what it tells us the error error with respect to y and y d okay, will remain bounded as long as y dot t is bounded okay. because b is a constant number after all actually. Okay. As long as y dot t is bounded then this error will remain bounded actually. Furthermore, if b is large okay, that means this bound is going to be smaller and smaller actually. Okay. That is one thing. Now let's re reinterpret uh, the same problem, defining y2 instead. Okay, y1 was defined like that. Let's formulate a problem 2 with y2, where not only we'll cancel this, but we'll add 1 minus, I mean 1 plus s by e in the denominator. So that's what we have not taken the zero part, but we have added a pole identically in the in the left side actually. Okay. Then what actually? So, you can st again do the same analysis again, but this time it is y double dot because s square will pop up. Okay. So, this e, t, e, e of t becomes a function of y double dot now actually. So, y, so, this e of t will remain bounded as long as y double dot is bounded and if b square is larger this time, okay, then, y, then obviously e, to e will be smaller and smaller. Now, naturally it turns out that okay, this selection probably is better than that, but, uh, but uh, non linear control you have to be slightly more careful. It, uh, it, uh, it, uh, you have to I mean kind of see these expressions very carefully and this analysis is true. So, the out, out of these two choices y 2 is, uh, is better provided this condition holds good <laughs> because it may, it may so happen in some problem that y dot uh, I mean this condition may not be valid actually. Then your y 1 selection is better. But if, the, if this condition holds good, then your y t is better actually. So these are like some of these uh, ideas that you can exploit. Another approach to deal with non-minimum phase, uh, first of all, is uh, like neglect terms in containing the input u while doing successive iterations of the output until number of successive differentiation becomes n actually. This is a trick that we regularly exploit in in aerospace design, by the way, okay, because if you see the six top equations that we discussed, uh, we derived also and things like that, your v dot w dot and all that will contain a, a term from control surface reflections as well, but these are not very powerful. So, if you really want to synthesize your controller directly from v dot w dot for the guidance purpose and things like that, then uh, your rotational dynamics will go unstable actually. So, how do you do? Normally, we try to take, I mean instead of v dot, we take v double dot instead and one of the design we will discuss in the one of the classes later probably. Okay where we will try to wind up this neuro adaptive design with uh, with a aircraft control and all that actually. So, instead of v dot we take v double dot and then neglect the control dot out there just simply to assume that that then that is 0 or things like that control effect is 0. Then you go to the next level of differentiation and then v, do, v double dot will contain r and things like that. So, w double dot will contain expressions of q or body rates basically and for uh, I mean that q dot r dot and all there is a still a control will appear. And because of that, uh, uh, the control is powerful for rotational dynamics and all that. So, the, at that level we want to uh, uh, use the dynamic inversion, we want to invert the matrix actually. So, these are the concepts uh, that you have to, I mean especially in aerospace uh, applications we use it regularly. So, what is the idea here? If uh, so at particular output level, let us say your uh, control appears, so you so do not get unnecessarily happy because that particular channel, the control may appear, but it may be very less effective. Okay. So, in that sense you can very well neglect the control variable and do one more derivative and then hope for the best in the sense the next level of derivative control can still appear one more time because, because you are talking derivatives of other state variables and all that and at that level the control may become powerful actually. So, you will have a good controllability at that, uh, that level actually. Okay. So, the, then you will use the regular dynamic inversion at that level of differentiation. So, that what you are telling here is uh, you will exciting more level of I mean more and more output derivatives actually. Okay. So, that is the philosophy that we use regularly actually. Okay. And as, as I told that this approach works uh, as long as the coefficient of u at the intermediate steps are small. That means, the system is weakly non-minimum phase. 
Okay. If, the, if, the, if the system turns out to be weakly non minimum phase, then this idea happen, uh, works wonderfully. And normally, the zero space problems, uh, it works very, very well actually. Other ideas, modify the desired trajectory. That means, if you have really assumed a sharp maneuver, do not assume sharp maneuver, vehicle is not capable. Uh, so, you use some sort of a well, benign maneuver, things like that. And then, the other alternative is modify the plant itself. That means, you go back and design the redesign the plant itself actually. It may be possible by relocation of the actuator sensors or by added, adding more number of actuator sensors in the in the loop actually basically. So, you are altering the transfer function or you are altering the system dynamics that you are looking for actually. Okay. So, it may be also possible by physical modification of the plant. That means, uh, for example, placing the control surfaces at different locations in an aircraft. So, these are like uh, bigger issues and all that. So, in that sense, the your, your plant itself you are changing. And so, in, in this first one you are uh, modifying your objective, the second one your, your plant itself you are changing actually. Okay. This is the way to do that. The next big issue okay, that is uh, the fourth one what we discussed before is the dynamic inversion design sensitive to modeling and parameter inaccuracies and the answer turns out to be very much yes actually. Okay. And the solution is uh, because of the this particular big issue, this uh, design was not very popular for a long time again and now people know how to handle this actually. So, if it becomes a big issue in your particular design, then they tell okay, let us not uh, use dynamic inversion as it is, but let us try to augment this using more uh, robust control design or, or ad adaptive control design techniques. That means, you will see. Uh, D i plus such infinity, D i plus adaptive control, D i plus neuro adaptive like that actually those ideas. And one popular approach that uh, we propose and we uh, use in our lab also like that is uh, what is called neuro adaptive control design. Okay. This adaptive control design philosophy where neural network is also in the loop actually. Okay. And this particular design we are going to discuss extensively anyway okay, in the subsequent lectures. So, I am not going to talk too much on that, but philosophically speaking. Uh, why do you need this uh, this thing? This uh, where this issue comes. So why do you need it? Parameter inaccuracy, modeling inaccuracy, and all that. So motivations for NA design, neuro adaptive design, is uh, as I told, the perfect system modeling is difficult. Okay, and source of imperfections uh, can arise from unmodeled dynamics. That means missing algebraic terms in the model, or inaccurate knowledge of the system parameters. You really don't have exact number. I mean values of the parameters. The parameters can keep changing also. For example, mass of the aircraft keeps changing eh, because at least fuel keeps on going out actually or mass of the rocket eh, changes very rapidly rather that way. And you can also have change of system parameter or system dynamics during operation. I mean it need not uh, remain constant forever actually. So, the adaptive control design should be able to learn the unknown function through the neural networks and then compensate, uh, compensate for this unknown error. So, the entire plant you know large part of the plant some person you do not know. So, that whatever unknown plant or unknown person uh, pops up, that person needs to be learned. I mean and this that unknown uh, I mean that uh, inaccuracy whatever you are talking is going to throw some sort of a unknown function in the system dynamics and that unknown function needs to be learned through the neural network and then once you learn it you can compensate for that actually. So, philosophically speaking the issue is something like this. So, let us say x dot equal to sin x that is actually known part of the system dynamics. But 2 is not 2, but for some reason it is 2.1. The point 0.1 we are not knowing what is this point 0.1 or minus point 0.1 or point minus, I mean minus point 0.2, whatever it is, that is not known to us. So, because this 2 has become 2.1, x dot has become like this. So, this additional nonlinear function has evolved because of parameter inaccuracy. Because of parameter inaccuracy, you had an uh, unknown function and all that. So, this particular function, if I analyze a little, I can tell oh, this part sin of sin x can be some sort of a basis function and delta c turns out to be some sort of a unknown coefficient. So, if I if I learn this function using this basis function as sin x or some other basis function can also hold good, then I actually know this unknown part uh, after learning. So, in, so, after learning, I will not use only 2 sin x, but I will I will be able to use entire thing actually. Because right, I mean, because this uh, this uh, system dynamics will no, no more be completely unknown. Basically, that's the whole idea there. We'll talk about that uh, in subsequent classes anyway. So summary summary of this entire dynamic inversion design. Uh, DI offers several advantages. First of all, I mean, we let's try to recapitulate again. It's a nonlinear design, and no linearization of system dynamics is necessary. 
it is a certainly a promising substitute for gain scheduling philosophy and quite often a constant gain is uh, found to be satisfactory even though limited amount of scheduling can still be done actually. It assures perfect tracking that means asymptotic stability of aerodynamics under the ideal assumption that perfect knowledge of the system dynamics is available. And the DI offers a closed form solution for the control and hence can be easily implemented for online applications. But when you implement DI design, one has to be careful about the following important issues. First of all, the non-existence of matrix inversion and if this is a local problem, do not update the control. And there is a stability of internal dynamics issue. If the analysis fails, then either for reformulate the problem or opt for output redefinition technique, there are options available to you. And robustness with respect to modeling inaccuracies and all, you can uh, augment the DI design with an error adaptive technique actually. Okay. So, with that, uh, I think I will stop this lecture. Thanks a lot.